All right, so I have the legendary Dean Ornish with me today. Um, Dean, I know we were making the connection before we got on here to um, kind of my past, but I just want to start off the episode um, with a thank you because you have not only impacted my life and your work has impacted my life, but when um, my dad was 35, he had open heart surgery. Wow. Um, it was right around the time you were coming out with your first research and your first book. Huh. And, and Dr. Deneen, uh, that we were talking about b- before we came on here, gave him your book. And that was like, I'm told I was too young to know, but <laughs> I, I'm told that that became kind of a Bible for him. And, um, oh, wow. you know, 30 years later and eight kids later, you know, he's, he's alive and well. Oh, that makes me so glad to hear that. That's really young, 35. Yeah. Do you have issues yourself? I'm sure you must have uh, been checked as well. Yeah, I, I was kind of on that path. I had um, all, all kinds of bodily issues at 25, from arthritis to asthma to... I was on that path, you know, and I, I stumbled into many of the things he stumbled into uh, 30 years ago. But um, yeah, so so thank you for me and thank you from the Macaulay family here in Boston. Oh, well, that makes my day to hear that. And uh, I didn't even know Jim Deneen was giving my book out. That makes me happy to know as well. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. uh, That's a name I haven't heard in a long time, but he he was a very inspiring uh, clinician and teacher. Mm. Mm. So my mom, as we, again, were talking about, uh, worked with you at Mass Mass General uh, during your residency, I believe. And she told me stories of you doing yoga and massage and people at the time thought you thought you were crazy or playing. I, I heard a story uh, from uh, a cousin of mine who also worked with you at the time as a nurse at Mass General uh, who said you'd be playing guitar and things like that. Um, and it seemed like you were very focused on your wellness at that time. But I've since learned that uh, before that, um, your wellness was in a, a very different place. And I think that's maybe a good place to start. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, well, going through an internship and residency at Mass General is definitely not the healthiest thing that somebody can do. Right. Uh, we're on call every, every third night. We're up all night. Um, I, I remember my first day of uh, internship, I was on call in the Phillips house. And uh, I had taken a year off to do some research. And my year before that, I had spent most of my elective time doing research. So I was really not prepared uh, the way that most people were. And so I just said to the nurses, I said, help me, you know, <laughs> you know more than I do. Um, please, you know, have my back. And, you know, they were, they were so used to people just, you know, pretending like they knew it all that they really rose to the occasion. And uh, I don't think I would have made it through without them. So I'll always be grateful to your mom and all the other nurses there. But um, when I was 19, I was a freshman at Rice University in Houston and had a, a really classic case of what's now called the imposter syndrome. I felt like I was stupid that somehow now that I was with a bunch of really smart kids, the admissions committee would realize what a big mistake they let, made in letting me in. And, and worse, my college roommate at the time was one of the four people that year who'd scored a perfect score on his SATs, his college entrance exams, and had a photographic memory. And I knew even then I wanted to go to medical school. And one of the most important classes for medical school is organic chemistry. And more organic chem- chemistry fair professor taught the whole course without any conceptual basis. It was all just memorizing one equation after another. And that's never been my strong suit. And so I began to worry that I wouldn't do well. And the first day of class, he said, look to your right and look to your left, and one of you won't be here by the end of the semester. And they took all these people, half the student body at the time had graduated, you know, first or second in their high school classes. And so they put them all under a a bell curve. And I started to worry that I was going to not fulfill my dream and uh, that I was really stupid. And worse, I had this, what really was a spiritual vision that nothing can bring lasting happiness. And so the combination of feeling that I was never going to mount anything, and even if I did, it wouldn't matter anyway, was profoundly depressing. So I remember sitting in class one day and I thought, you know what, why don't I just kill myself? You know, uh, dead people look like they're peaceful. And I was so agitated, I could barely sit down. And then I uh, had such a hard time sleeping that I was up for a week straight, which that kind of sleep deprivation will make anyone crazy. And, but the good news, in a way, was that I ran myself so ragged that I got a really uh, horrible case of infectious mononucleosis to the point where I literally couldn't get out of bed, which saved my life, ironically. 
And then by then my parents got word that I was a mess and they came and saw what a, a wreck I was and went home to Dallas. And my plan was to get well enough to kill myself, as crazy as that sounds. Meanwhile, my older sister, who had been a child of the 60s, this was back in 1973, um, had benefited from studying with an ecumenical uh, spiritual teacher named Swami Satchidananda. If you ever saw the, the Woodstock documentary, he's the Swami who opened Woodstock, and he was brought over here in, in 1966 by Peter Max, the artist. And uh, there's an old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears, and that was certainly true for me. So in walks this what looks like central castings uh, idea of what a Swami should look like, you know, long satin <laughs> robes and white beard and the whole bit. And he gave a, a satsang, a lecture in our living room. And he started off by saying, nothing can bring you lasting happiness, which I'd already figured out, but everyone else I talked to said, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, get into medical school, be happy, get rich and famous, then, you know, uh, you'll be happy. And I knew that wasn't true. So, but then I looked at him and he was literally glowing and I was like ready to do myself in. I thought, well, what am I missing here? And he went on to say what probably sounds like a, a new age cliche, but it turned my life around, which is that nothing can bring us lasting happiness is the bad news. The good news is we have that already and we're not aware of it most of the time, that our nature by and large is to be happy and healthy. And not being mindful of that, we always end up saying, gosh, I really feel lonely. I feel depressed. I'm unhappy. I must be lacking something. If only I had more whatever, more money, more power, more sex, more beauty, more accomplishment, then I'd be happy, then people would love me, then I wouldn't feel so lonely and everything would be great. And what he went on to say was that once you set up that view of the world, which is a very common way of looking at things, the whole advertising industry really is based on that, that misconception. Um, however, it turns out you're going to feel bad because if you don't get it, you feel bad, of course. And, uh, and this, you know, we know that the stress is not just what you do, but how you react to what you do. And how you react to what you do is how you perceive things. And if you perceive that I've got to get whatever it is to be happy and healthy, then the stakes go way up, the stresses go way up. So until you get it, you're really stressed. If, if you don't get it, you're stressed. If someone else gets it, then it feels very, uh, like we live in this very competitive doggy dog. But even if we get it, it's very seductive in the moment because it's like, ah, oh, I got it, now I'm happy. But invariably, it doesn't last. Uh, later, when I was doing research, when patients often said things to me like, I can't even enjoy the view from the mountain I've climbed. I'm already looking over the next one. You know, big deal. You know, now what is, you know, the expression. Or so what, big deal. It doesn't really provide the lasting meaning that I thought it would. Another patient often say that the letdown that comes from accomplishing a goal is so great, I always make sure I've got a dozen projects going at the same time. And so they said, well, this didn't do it. Maybe, maybe that will. So the cycle continues. And so what, the swan, what I learned from the Swami, he said, look, <clears throat> if you change your diet, you know, I always grew up in Texas where – you know, shit is a three-syllable word, and uh, I was eating meat three or four or five times a day. <clears throat> Change your diet, eat a plant-based diet, um, meditate, and I couldn't even sit still, so he taught me how to meditate when I was walking. Um, uh, get some exercise and love more. Um, then you can quiet down your mind and body enough to experience that inner sense of peace and joy and well-being that's always there. And in perhaps what may be the ultimate irony in life we all often run after all these things that we think are going to bring us what we could already have if we just stopped doing that. And, and so it changes. And so when I began to get glimpses of that, it changed the equation from how can I get what I think I need to be happy, <clears throat> like how can I get into medical school and so on, to how can I stop disturbing what's already there. And that may sound like, you know, semantics and parsing words and so on, but it's really very, it's really very um, empowering. Because if it's out there, then everyone who has something that I think I need has power over me. Um, but if it's me, not to blame myself, but to empower myself, I can do something about that. So I thought, okay, well, let me move killing myself down to plan B. Let me try this other weird stuff and see if it, if it makes a difference. And I began to really just get glimpses of that at the end of a meditation, as badly as I was doing it, uh, I got glimpses, of, oh, I, I really do feel better. I really feel more peaceful. And the Swami would say to remind yourself, to remind yourself that the meditation didn't bring you a sense of peace, which is often what people think. Almost like Valium in another form, but rather it simply temporarily at least stopped disturbing what was already there. And uh, later the Swami liked to make puns. People say, what are you, a, a Hindu? He'd say, no, I'm an undo, you know, which is really where the title of my new book, Undo It, came from. It's kind of homage to him, as well as the fact that my 
favorite key on the computer keyboard has always been the undo button. I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had that in our lives? And, and now to a much larger degree than I once realized we do. So I went back to school, went to change, transferred to the University of Texas in Austin, um, and uh, graduated first in my class, gave the baccalaureate. And I say that not to brag, but to say, when I really thought that I had to get all these things to get into medical school to be happy and all that, I was so stressed, I literally couldn't read a newspaper and tell you, you know, a few minutes later what it said. But the paradox is the more annually defined I was, the more I was able to actually succeed in the world, even though I needed the success a lot less than I thought I did, because I didn't have the stress and the anxiety that often go along with that. So later when I was in medical school uh, at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, <clears throat> I, I was on Michael DeBakey's surgical service, and he was the, one of the people who invented coronary bypass surgery. And we cut people open, we bypass their clogged arteries, he'd tell them they were cured. And more often than not, he'd go, you know, people would go home and they would do all the things that had caused the problem in the first place. They'd smoke cigarettes and eat junk food and not manage stress, not exercise. And all too often, the new bypasses would clog up. It'd be kind of like changing the oil filter in your car without changing the oil. You know, you put a new filter and it's just going to clog up again. Uh, or, you know, mopping up the floor around the sink that's overflowing and nobody's turning off the faucet. So the problem just keeps coming back. Or even later, you know, the bypasses clog up, you know, or if you get put on drugs to lower your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and you say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? What does the doctor say? Forever, right? It's like, how long do I have to keep mopping up the floor? Like forever. Well, why don't we just turn off the faucet, treat the cause? And when we do that, and the cause more often than not are these lifestyle choices that we make each day, we find that our bodies often have a remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than we had once realized when we can treat the cause. So <clears throat> I decided to take off a, a year between my second and third years of medical school, much to my parents' dismay, uh, to do a pilot study of 10 men and women who had bad heart disease. And um, uh, went to every hotel in Houston, the last one, gave us 10 rooms for a month, uh, did everything myself except cook the food. And the patients got better. Eight of the 10 actually, their chest pain went away and the blood flow to their heart improved. And at that time it was thought that once you had heart disease, it could only get worse. And uh, maybe you could slow down the rate at which it got worse, but it was going to get worse and worse. We showed for the first time that instead of getting worse and worse, people got better in only a month, which was people thought was a crazy idea, especially since we know that heart disease literally takes decades to build up. When they looked at uh, autopsies of soldiers killed in wartime, you know, in Korea or Vietnam or wherever, um, they found that even at the age of 18 or 19, most of them had the beginning of blockages in their coronary arteries. So this is a process that occurs over decades. So the idea that it could be reversible was thought of crazy, but especially that it could happen so quickly. And so um, and people say, well, it was also my first experience of how when you're doing something that's truly disruptive, it's not often met with uh, universal acceptance. Like, well, how do you know they wouldn't have gotten better anyway? You didn't have a randomized control group. I said, well, that's technically true. But have you ever had any of your patients get better like this? No, but that's what I think, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, so I went back to school, finished my MD, took another year off. This time did a randomized trial with the, uh, only a, a three and a half weeks. Again, found they got better, and we published that in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Then went to Boston, to Harvard, and Mass General, as we talked about. Then moved back to San Francisco, or moved to San Francisco to um, uh, join, became a professor at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, and began the most definitive study called the Lifestyle Heart Trial. Uh, we showed that there was some reversal of the actual blockages in the arteries after one year, which had never been seen before, and even more reversal after five years. And we published that in The Lancet and, and in the Journal of the AMA, uh, whereas the randomized control group got worse after one year and even much worse after five years. And so one of the reasons that I've spent the last 44 years doing these research studies is that they're really hard to do. They're hard to raise money for because people generally don't want to give money for something that everyone thinks is impossible. It's like, well, we know it can't work. Why would we want to waste our money? And it's a bit of a catch 22 because without the funding, you can't show it works. And if they don't think it's going to work, they don't want to fund it. So we just keep kind of raise the money as we go along. And that seems to be working. And ultimately we get funding from major foundations or the national institutes of health. But the reason why I do this, even though they're hard to get funded, they're hard to get published, they're hard to do, is that, <clears throat> pardon me, properly done and published in the leading peer-reviewed journals with the leading collaborators, it can redefine what's possible. And by doing so, it can empower people and give them, at this point, millions of people uh, new hope and new choices that they didn't have before. Um, 11 years ago, after many years of review, 
uh, Medicare created a new benefit category to cover my program for reversing heart disease, which is great because when you change reimbursement, you change medical practice and even medical education. And so now uh, we've been training hospitals. I've been working with a company called ShareCare, and we've been training hospitals and clinics and physicians around the country to do this. But we had a real breakthrough about um, a couple of months ago where Medicare agreed to cover my reversing heart disease program when done via Zoom, being done virtually, like we're having this conversation today. So now we can reach everyone in the country, not just those who happen to live near one of the hospitals or clinics we've trained. So this can help reduce health disparities and health inequities and really get it to the people who most need it. Uh, and uh, ultimately, we can do this anywhere in the world. So it's an exciting time. Uh, we found later that these same lifestyle changes that could reverse heart disease could reverse a wide variety of other chronic diseases, the ones that happen to be the most costly and the most uh, common. Uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, um, early stage prostate cancer. We did a, a randomized trial with the chair of urology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York at the time, and the chair of urology at the time at University of California, San Francisco. And we found that these same lifestyle changes that could reverse heart disease could stop or reverse the progression of men with early stage prostate cancer. And by extension, likely women with, with early stage breast cancer. Um, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. We, uh, we're now in the midst of doing the first randomized trial to see if we can reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease. I think we're at a place with Alzheimer's very reminiscent of where we were you know, back in 1977 when I started doing research on, on heart disease. In other words, at that time, heart disease, as we talked about, was thought the best you could do would be to slow down the rate at which you get worse, and that's it. That's what people think about Alzheimer's now. There are no drugs that can even stop its from getting worse, much less improve it. And they've been spent billions and billions of dollars to try to find a drug and they've all failed. At best, you can slow down the rate at which it gets worse. The first drug that was approved by the FDA in 20 years, a few months ago, aducanumab, um, probably never should have been approved. It, you know, a lot of uh, hospitals won't even use it because it just slows the rate at which you get worse a little bit. A third of the people get bleeding into their brain and brain, brain swelling, so they have to stop taking it. It's $56,000 per dose. It doesn't do all that much, but it just shows you how desperate people are for some hope because when you lose your memories, you lose everything. My mom uh, died of Alzheimer's. She was a, a, a brilliant person. It was just tragic watching that. Most of her siblings got it. I have one of the genes for it. And so if I think what a place with Alzheimer's is very reminiscent that back then it was thought the best you could do would be to slow it down. We found that it takes a lot to reverse a chronic disease. You know, it's ounce of prevention, pound of cure. This is more the pound of cure, if you will. Uh, the reason we were able to show that for the first time with these other conditions is that most people didn't go far enough. If you're just trying to stay healthy, lose a few pounds, you know, get your cholesterol or blood pressure down, moderate changes are often enough to do that. But if you're actually trying to reverse a chronic disease, it's hard. It takes a lot to do that. And so I think our hypothesis is that uh, because the same mechanisms that affect heart disease affect Alzheimer's and so many other conditions, what's good for your heart is good for your brain, that we're hoping that we may be able to show that these same lifestyle changes may stop or even perhaps even reverse the progression of men and women who have early stage Alzheimer's. If we show that, and it's still a big if, but we're halfway through the study now, and if we can show that, then it can redefine what's possible in that area as well. And ultimately, if that works, it could give millions of people uh, new hope and new choices. We also found, and by the way, we're still recruiting patients for the study. So if anyone's watching this and is, you know, has a problem themselves or has a family member that does, just go to our website at ornish.com and it'll provide information on how to uh, let us know that you're interested. We also did a study with Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome and found that when you change your lifestyle, it actually changes your genes. It turns on the good genes and turns off the bad genes. You know, when, when I was in medical school, we were taught that the only way to change your genes was to change your, your uh, parents, which of course you can't do. Um, and so often I hear people say, oh, I've just got bad genes, you know, what can I do about it? Uh, President Clinton is, uh, has been one of my patients for many, many years. He's talked about this publicly. And 14 years ago, when his bypass is clogged up, his cardiologist held a press conference on CNN and he said, oh, his diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it, it was all in his genes. And having worked for him, with him for many years, I knew it had everything to do with it. So I sent him a note and I said, look, the, the, the people I um, appreciate the most are the ones, the friends I appreciate the most are the ones who tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And I, you need to know it's not all in your genes. If it were all in your genes, you'd be a victim. And you're not a victim. You're not helpless. You're one of the most powerful guys on the planet. 
Uh, if you're willing to make these lifestyle changes, you can change your genes. You can turn on the good genes and turn off the bad genes. And that's what, we've, and, and that's what he began doing that 14 years ago. He's, he's gotten better since then, which is, um, you know, whatever your politics, when a former president does that, I think that especially one who was known for, you know, going to McDonald's as often as he did. I think it's such a great example for everyone. But also it's very empowering for people to know and say, and say, oh, I've just got bad genes. There's nothing I can change. Genes were changed in just three months, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad. And when you change the expression of genes, particularly you're changing the genes themselves, what you're actually doing is switching on the good genes and switching off the bad genes. But functionally, it's though you're changing your genes. We also did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn, who uh, got the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work with telomeres, the end of our chromosomes that regulate aging. Uh, they're like the plastic tips on the end of a shoelace that keep your shoelace from unraveling. They keep your DNA from unraveling. And over time, as our DNA replicates, the telomeres get shorter. And as your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter. And the risk of premature death from a wide variety of conditions, heart disease, diabetes, prostate, breast cancer, Alzheimer's, go up proportionate to that. And she had done studies with Alyssa Apple and others showing that uh, unhealthy lifestyle changes, you know, when you're under chronic stress or when you smoke cigarettes or you eat junk food or, you don't, or you're sedentary, your telomeres get shorter faster. In fact, they did a study with women who were taking care of kids with autism, and they found that when they compared the high stress and the low stress women, the high stress women, their telomeres got so much shorter that it was as though they had decreased their lifespan by 9 to 17 years, huge differences. But what was even more important to me was that it wasn't the objective measure of stress that determined its effect on telomeres. It was the women's perception. In other words, if they felt like, we know the stress comes not from what you do, but how you react to what you do. So the women who were meditating, eating well, you know, had a lot of social support, um, they weren't as affected. So even if you can't change what's happening to you, we have a lot more control over how we react to what's happening to you. And when you meditate on a regular basis, I've heard so many patients say things like, you know, I used to have a short fuse and I'd explode easily. And now my fuse is longer. Things just don't bother me as much. It's not like I have to hold it in or explode. I just, things don't bother me as much. Anyway, we did a study with Dr. Blackburn and I said, you know, if bad things make your telomeres shorter, maybe good things make them longer. And sure enough, we found that the telomeres actually got longer by about 10%, whereas they got shorter in the control group. And when we published this, the Lancet editor sent out a press release and they said it was the first study showing that lifestyle changes may reverse aging at a cellular level. Now, the new book, Undo It, which is, just came out in paperback, um, puts forth this new unifying theory that uh, I was trained, like most doctors, to view heart disease and diabetes and prostate cancer and Alzheimer's and so on as being fundamentally different diseases, different diagnoses, and different treatments. But what I realized is that over the last four decades, it wasn't like we had one set of diet and lifestyle recommendations for reversing heart disease, a different one for diabetes or prostate cancer or whatever. It was the same for all of them. So how can that be? Why would these same lifestyle changes affect so many different diseases? And I realized kind of in a blinding flash of the obvious in retrospect is that they're not so different. These diseases, you know, we're, we're trained to view them as different, but they're really not so different. And the reason they're not so different is that they all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome, the 100 trillion cells that live in our gut, uh, angiogenesis, gene expression, telomeres, and so on. And each one of these biological mechanisms in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. You know, to reduce it to its essence, uh, eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. Uh, the, the book begins with one of my favorite quotes, which is by um, Albert Einstein. It says, if you can't if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I really think that when you reduce it down to its essence, this is what it comes down to. And it's, it helps to explain why the same patient may have what are called comorbidities. Um, they'll have heart disease and die, type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol and be overweight and so on. Because again, it's just the same underlying cause manifesting and expressing itself in all these different ways. Or, Entire countries, China 50 years ago, had very low rates of all these chronic diseases until they started to, you know, eat like us and live like us and now die like us. You know, it's, um, it's an experiment on a global scale. And so it really radically simplifies what we tell people. So you don't have to 
say, well, what do I do? You know, it's this for them, it's this for the other. It's really the same for all of these things. And so the Undo It book really radically simplifies these lifestyle recommendations and helps explain the scientific basis behind them and how you can incorporate these powerful, these simple changes into your life. The last thing I want to say, and then I'll, I know this has been a long winded uh, thing, is that um, one of the biggest obstacles I found over the years that people say, oh, lifestyle changes, that's kind of boring, you know. It has to be something like a new drug, a new laser, a new device, a surgical procedure to be powerful. And I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. I mean, within uh, three weeks, there's a 90% reduction in the frequency of, of chest pain. Uh, and for someone who can't walk across the street without getting chest pain or make love with their spouse or play with their kids or go back to work without, you know, having angina. And within a few weeks, they're pain-free. It just completely reframes the reason for why you want to change your lifestyle from preventing from fear, like, oh, you know, put that burger down, you get a heart attack, put that cigarette down, you get lung cancer or a stroke or whatever. That's hard for people to really relate to because we all know we're going to die. It's just a question of when the mortality rate is still, you know, hundred percent, it's one per person, but we don't think about it most of the time. Now, if someone's had a heart attack, they'll think about it a lot, but even then for only a month or two, and then the denial comes back. It's just too scary to think about the fact that we're all going to die at some point. So we, we don't generally. So I've just found that, that fear is not really a sustainable motivator, but what is sustainable is joy and pleasure and love and feeling good. And when you make big changes in lifestyle, most people find they feel so much better so quickly it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy of living, which is. You know, your brain gets more blood. You think more clearly. You have more energy. You, you can grow so many new brain neurons through a process called neurogenesis. Your brain can actually get bigger in just a few months, believe it or not. That was thought impossible when I was in medical school. Your skin gets more blood, so you look younger. You know, I'm, I'm 96. I look pretty good. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I feel pretty good. Um, your heart gets more blood. You can reverse heart disease. Your sexual organs get more blood flow. There's a, a wonderful documentary called The Game Changers that came out a couple of years ago that uh, James Cameron, who did uh, Avatar and Terminator and all these great uh, movies, he became a vegan uh, after he, he's also an explorer. And when he realized that more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined, he went on a plant-based diet for the environment, but he found it helped him so much. You know, he's now making Avatar's two, three, and fourth at the same time, he's got so much energy <clears throat> that he um, decided he wanted to make this documentary with Luis Sahoyos and James Wilkes and others. And it's turned out to be the number one most downloaded documentary in iTunes and Netflix history. And it looks at how when people who are elite athletes went on a plant-based diet, how it just upped their game. They became you know, the, the mixed martial artist national champion. The Tennessee Titans became NFL champions. Um, Dotsie Bausch became an Olympic uh, medalist uh, at the age of almost 40, you know, in, in cycling and so on. But they had this wonderful scene, which uh, apparently the film crew went on a plant-based diet after shooting this. Have you seen the film? I sure have. Yeah, so you know the scene I'm talking about where <laughs> yeah. they have these three uh, guys and they feed them a single meat-based meal and then they measure they put this device on at night because guys have erections at night it's kind of a normal function throughout the night as they sleep and they measure the frequency and hardness of erections they had when they slept and then they did it the next night they give them a single plant-based meal and they repeated the experiment and all three guys had between you know uh, 10 to 15 percent harder erections and three to five hundred percent more frequent erections after the single plant-based meal than after the meat-based meal and it just shows you, again, how dynamic these mechanisms are. And also, you know, 40% of guys in their 40s are, have problems with erectile dysfunction, 50% of guys in their 50s, 60% in their 60s, and so on. Um, and, you know, when you realize that, oh, um, I can have better sex, you know, I can um, have more endurance as an athlete, you know, I can uh, reverse my heart disease, you know, uh, it changes the, the equation from, preventing something bad from happening years down the road or living to be 86 instead of 85, which doesn't really motivate most people to, Oh, what I gain is so much more than what I give up. That's a choice worth making because, you know, uh, I like the way I feel so much better when I eat this way. Mm. That's amazing. You, you just rattled through so many um, of the questions I had written <laughs> down in, in, in such a, such a, a great manner. Um, that that's absolutely awesome. So, you mentioned focusing more on what you gain 
um, than what you give up. Like it's, it's one thing to be presented with all this information that you just presented, right? Um, and getting the information and knowing that, um, you know, you can take back your health with certain changes to your lifestyle, but it's a totally different game to actually make them. And I know, and the reason why Medic you know, Medicaid uh, funds your program and, and everything is that you have had success in getting people to change which I think is the million dollar question. So can you talk a little bit more on like how you go about uh, not only empowering the individual, but focusing on um, what they gain and not what they lose? Yeah, it's the trillion dollar question. Actually, we spend trillions mm. of dollars on, on health every year. And Medicare um, is covering the program. Uh, Aetna is covering in all 50 states, Anthem and all the 14 states, including New York and California, that it does. Many of the Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations, many of the the, uh, most of the insurance companies are, are paying for it because I didn't want this just to be concierge medicine, just people who had money. I want it to be for everyone, having seen what a, a powerful difference these simple lifestyle changes can make. And we've uh, been working with a company called ShareCare. So if you have heart disease or know someone who does, go to Ornish.com and um, you know, let us know where you are. And we'll, like I say, we have sites we've trained, but very soon we'll be doing this program virtually via Zoom. So anybody will, will have access to it and Medicare and many other insurance companies will pay for the whole thing, which is wonderful. Um, but what we've learned, again, you know, 96% of the people complete all 72 hours of training. That's crazy. I mean, to put that in context, only, you know, half to two-thirds of the people who are prescribed Lipitor or statin drugs to lower their cholesterol are not taking them after just four to six. They don't have that many side effects. So why, you know, taking a pill is possible. That's crazy that, you know, we're getting much better adherence to this intensive lifestyle changes than just taking a pill. Why is that? And the reason is that the statins don't make you feel better, but the lifestyle changes do. And plus we give people a lot of support. You know, the people say, okay, eat well, I get that. Move more, sure, exercise, everyone knows it's good for you. Uh, stress less, okay, I'll do some meditation. It's kind of weird, but then I'll do that too. But the love more, that's kind of weird. What is, what is that about? You know, I mean, you live in Marin County. It's that, that's just that touchy-feely kind of stuff. And I used to kind of get defensive and say, oh, no, no, look at our, this is hard science. Look at our quantitative arteriograms and our cardiac, you know, positron emission tomography and radionuclide ventriculography and blah, blah, blah. And then one day I said, you know what? This is touchy-feely. That's why it works so well, because we are touchy-feely creatures. We are creatures of community. That's how we've survived as a species over the years. You know, <clears throat> one, of, one of the things I talk about in the book is that, in the Undo It book, is that study after study have shown that when people are lonely and depressed and isolated, they are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community. And so the real pandemic isn't just COVID and heart disease and diabetes, it's loneliness and depression. You know, more money is spent on antidepressants than just about anything else. And, um, and in part, it's because of the breakdown of the social networks that used to give people a sense of love and connection and community. You know, 50 years ago, um, when I was a kid, most people had an extended family they saw regularly. They had a neighborhood with two or three generations of people that grew up together. They had a job that felt secure. They'd been at for, you know, a decade or more. They had a, a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a club they went to regularly. But many people today don't have any of those. And we think, well, okay, that's just, you know, modern times. But we pay a real price for that. Again, people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely for pretty much everything. And so why is that? Well, when you grow up in a neighborhood with two or three generations of people, or you see your extended family as you're growing up, they really know you. They don't just know your Facebook profile or your bio sketch. They know when you messed up. You know, they know, they remember when you got busted or when you got suicide depressed in my case or whatever it happens to be. And you know that they know <laughs> and they know that you know that they know and they're still there for you. There's just something really primal about, you know, I see you like in, uh, again, James Cameron's uh, Avatar films, which was really from an African proverb. I see you. I see all of you, not just your good stuff, but I see your dark stuff and your demons and, and I'm still there for you. It's why AA works as well as it does. Because people can say they just talk about all their stuff, you know, and they're still there for you. And so that gives permission for other people to talk about their stuff. And many people don't have that. In fact, one of the studies that my wife Ann and I, who we've worked together now for 20 some odd years, cite in our, in our new Undo It book is the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are. 
because it's not a true intimacy. It's a false intimacy. In other words, it's all about here I am in front of the Eiffel Tower and here I am with my perfect family, you know, and, and it looks like everybody's got this perfect life but you. It just makes you feel bad, you know, when you start to read everyone else's posts about, oh, here's this great stuff I'm doing, here's this great stuff that I'm doing, and go like, shit, you know, what's wrong with me, you know? And so what we do in our support groups is not just help people stay on the diet. A lot of people think, oh, your support groups, that's just, you know, to help people exercise and stay on the diet. And it certainly does that. But the real purpose of that <clears throat> is to recreate that sense of, community, that sense of safety, that sense of uh, vulnerability, because you can only be, to me, intimacy is healing. Anything that brings us together is healing. Even the word healing comes from the root to make whole. Uh, yoga is from the Sanskrit, means to yoke, to unite, union, to bring together. These are really old ideas that we're rediscovering. And so in our support groups, we, we create a safe environment. We say what goes in the group stays in the group. You know, you can talk about anything. It's all about confidentiality, because you can only be intimate to the degree that you can open your heart and be vulnerable emotionally. And we've all had experiences when we opened up and got hurt. So, you know, there's a, like a wall around the heart that says, hey, it's not safe, you know. So we want to just create a sense of safety by saying, you know, there's confidentiality here. Whatever you say won't, won't go outside the group. Uh, to talk about your feelings, because it's our feelings that really connect us with each other. Again, we come back to that whole touchy-feely thing. It's so easy to make fun of. But it's our feelings that really connect us. Let, let me give you, can I just give you a quick example of that? Absolutely. Okay, so close your eyes for a moment. And if you're watching this at home, um, don't do this if you're driving. <laughs> Kids don't try this one at home. These are trained professions. Uh, but close your eyes for just a moment. And tell me how it feels when I say the following. Uh, Pat, I think you're a jerk and I think you're wrong. And open your eyes. <laughs> how did that feel? Didn't feel good. Yeah, did that make you want to get to know me better at that moment? No. Probably not, no. Or, or to find out why I thought you were a jerk, probably not. What, we generally have two primal responses when we feel attacked or judged like that. What, 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 what is one, how would you, if this was, you know, this is just a, a fun thing, but still on a visceral level, you probably had some kind of reaction. If this was real life, what would, that have, what would you have wanted to do next? Well, as we say here in Boston, Dean, I'd say go fuck yourself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Something along those right lines. Here. Exactly. Uh, yeah, react and then leave type thing. Right, those are the two things. Either you attack back or you leave. Mm. Now, if the goal is to bring people together, both of those are going to take us in the opposite direction, right? I'm not a jerk, you're a jerk or whatever. Or I'm out of here. Or you just zone out, you stop listening. So uh, let's try it a different way and tell me if it's the same or different for you. So close your eyes again and tell me how this feels. I feel angry and I feel upset. And then open your eyes. Same or different? Different. different. I, feel, I feel like I want to help you. Exactly. Or you may want to also feel like you want to get to know why I feel that way. Yeah, or I want to share what I'm going through as well after you say that. Exactly. Now, this is not about making nice. It's not about, you know... Uh, the Power of Positive Thinking. My mom wrote a song years ago called If You Can't Say Anything Good About Anyone, Don't Say Anything At All. It's not about that. It's, I mean, these are, quote, negative emotions. I'm angry. I'm upset. And yet the first example, you wanted to punch me or worse or, or leave, which you know, takes us away from intimacy. The second one actually brings you in. You want to know why you feel this way and talk about how you feel, which is really brings us together. The difference is that the first one is, first example was a thought and a judgment, and the second was a feeling. And again, it's so easy to make fun of feelings, but it's our feelings that really connect us. So in the group process, we say to people, um, identify what you're feeling and then express it as a feeling, not as a thought or a judgment, because it's our feelings that connect us. And also, a feeling is true by definition. If I say, I think you're a jerk, we can argue about whether that's true or not. If I say, I feel angry and upset, you can't tell me I don't feel that way. That's a true statement, but our feelings are true by definition, right? Now, you can have a thought masquerading as a feeling. You can say, I feel that you're a jerk, and that's still a thought. You know, that's not a feeling. A feeling is I'm upset, I'm angry, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm anxious, I'm worried, whatever it is. Um, and so that we can get to these incredibly deep levels of intimacy, and people who are total strangers within a few weeks are sharing things with each other that, you know, the, their own spouses may not even know about, because we can create that sense of intimacy. And that's part of why we get such high levels of adherence, because... One of the things I've learned when I've been doing these studies, because I got to know the patients so well, 
as early on, I'd say, you know, teach me something. Why do you smoke? Why do you overeat? Why do you drink too much? Why do you work too hard? Why do you abuse opioids? Why do you play so many video games? These behaviors seem so maladaptive to me. And they'd look at me and they'd go, you don't get it. You don't have a clue, Dean. These behaviors aren't maladaptive. They're very adaptive. They help us deal with our pain, our loneliness, our depression, our isolation. I've had um, several patients over the years say, I've got 20 friends in this package of cigarettes, and they're always there for me, and nobody else is. You're going to take away my 20 friends? What are you going to give me? Or they'll say, um, uh, food fills that void. Or a well-known food writer years ago from the New York Times said, uh, fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain. Or we have an opioid epidemic to numb the pain. Or alcohol epidemic. Or other drugs or video games are a good way to distract yourself from your pain more money is spent on video games and on movies these days um, working all the time is something we've all done to distract ourselves from our pain so it goes back to turning off the faucet instead of mopping up the floor if we can treat the cause which is the loneliness and depression and isolation in ways that don't involve these other behaviors which can be so damaging then we find that by, you know, teaching people to meditate so they can quiet down their mind and experience more of an inner sense of peace and well-being, uh, to have ways of communicating with other people in our support groups where they can really feel an authentic sense of intimacy, um, then they're much less likely to, to need to make lifestyle choices that are, life, that are damaging as opposed to ones that are life-enhancing. That's really the, the, one of the major, major reasons why we're able to get such high levels of adherence, because it really creates a sense of meaning. And if it's meaningful, then it's sustainable. The other thing we've learned is that people think, oh, if it's hard, you know, it's too hard, nobody will do it. Um, but I love that moonshot speech that John F. Kennedy gave at Rice University, as it turns out, you know, coincidentally, 10 years before I was there. He said, we're going to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. You know, there's some things that are hard or meaningful. I mean, anybody who's got kids will say, you know, it was the hardest thing I ever did, but yeah, I would do it. I mean, I wouldn't throw them back. You know, it's the most meaningful thing I ever did. Um, they, you know, my spiritual teacher used to say they build temples on hills with lots of steps because you have to work hard to get there. So you'll appreciate it more when you do. So the fact that it's hard to change lifestyle doesn't mean people shouldn't do it, you know. And we also found that um, just the act of choosing not to do certain things imbues those choices with meaning. You know, all spiritual traditions have um, dietary guidelines, pretty much. You know, they all may differ from each other, but whatever the intrinsic benefit of eating or not eating certain foods, just the act of saying, I'm not going to eat certain foods, or on certain days I want to eat certain foods, or certain times of day, or certain you know, weeks of the year, or whatever, makes them meaningful. Um, and if they're meaningful, then they're sustainable. Um, or choosing to be in a committed monogamous relationship. Is that you know, the ball and chain? Well, it can be, but it also can be, a, again, like in our support groups, when you totally commit to someone, and you create a safe place, again, you can only be intimate to the degree you can be vulnerable emotionally. And if you feel like you're safe with this person, then your heart can open wider and wider and wider and wider. It's a, an infinite process. And so instead of having the same kind of experience with different people, you have these infinitely variable experiences with the same person. And the more intimate it is, the more erotic it becomes, the more playful, the more joyful, the more meaningful. And so again, it comes down to what you gain is so much more than what you give up. That's part of what makes these uh, lifestyle changes so, so, so sustainable. And ultimately, it's about transformation. You know, I mean, look, if you told me when I was suicidally depressed that I was going to live longer if I just changed my lifestyle, I'd say, you know, you don't get it. I'm just trying to get through the day like so many people. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, we assume that people want to live longer. But telling someone who's depressed and lonely and anxious and, and, and isolated that they're going to live longer, they go, I don't know if I want to sign up for that or not. You know, maybe I just want to kill myself slowly with all these different things. And so what I'm finding is that uh, I could take all the meaning out of life when I was depressed. That's what being depressed is. You know, that sense of helplessness and hopelessness, which is the hallmark of depression, really comes from being able to take, suck all the meaning out of life. You know, who cares? No, about, you know, what, you know, so what? Big deal. Nothing matters. Why bother? You know, all these kind of existential angst things. And also it's a reality distortion that, um, you know, the hallmark of depression is the sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And that comes from really thinking you're seeing things clearly for the first time, you know, that things are bad, they'll always be bad, they've always been bad. And anytime you thought otherwise, you were just fooling yourself. And so just as I learned, I could take all the meaning out of life, I learned that I could put meaning in my life. And one of the ways of imbuing my life with meaning is not eating certain foods or being committed or uh, a life of service, you know, um, the, the more you help other people, the more it helps you. 
You know, I like, like, let me just ask you to which organ, when your heart pumps blood, where does the blood go first? Just guess, doesn't matter. I suppose up, up towards my head. Yeah, most people would say like my brain or whatever. It actually pumps blood to itself first through the coronary arteries so that it can then pump blood to the rest of the body. And if those arteries get clogged and it can't feed itself, the rest of the body dies too. So is that selfish that it takes that it pumps blood to itself first? Or is it really both? You know, you, the most unselfish thing it can do is to feed itself first because otherwise the rest of the body is going to die. And so when we can live life that way, you know, that we take care of ourselves so that we can lead a useful life. You know, you're raising awareness with your podcasts. I'm doing the work I'm doing. You know, they bring meaning to my life to be able to know that it's helping other people. I feel like I've been living on borrowed time ever since I was 19 because I came so close to killing myself. And it gives me a sense of freedom to be able to say like, well, what's the worst that could happen? You know, let me try these weird studies. People think they're going to fail. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Fortunately, they've all succeeded. But, you know, failure isn't such a terrible thing. You know, there's a lot. I mean, when I work with people who are dying, they generally don't uh, regret what they did. They generally regret what they didn't do. Because if you do something and it turns out to be a mistake, there's a lot of wisdom that comes from making mistakes and learning from them. I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made and I have a lot of wisdom because of that. And I decided very consciously when I decided not to kill myself that I wanted to live a, uh, I, I needed to know for myself what was true and what was real. I couldn't, you know, I, I, I didn't want to get it secondhand. I couldn't borrow anyone else's reality. And so if it wasn't going to, you know, permanently damage myself or hurt someone or hurt anyone else, I was going to try as many different weird things as I could just so I would know. So I, when I got to the end of my life, I wouldn't have regrets that, well, what would that have been like? Or what would this have been like? And so I, done a lot of really interesting things, a lot of really stupid things. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom that comes from that because I really know. And so it gives me the courage to try things in my professional life that seem like huge risks. In many ways they are, but for me it's like, well, however it turns out, I'm going to learn something. So it's a good thing. And so understanding and, and being able to imbue my life with meaning by the actions that I'm doing and through a life of service, not, you know, in a uh, Mother Teresa way, but just because that's what brings me happiness and meaning in my life. You know, I learned I could take all the meaning out of life. That wasn't fun at all. I, I don't ever want to go back to those really dark places. But when I can imbue my life with meaning, again, what I gain is so much more than what I give up. You know, that's what I love is what I call this, this research and this work that I do and that my wife and I have been doing for so many years is really what we call a, a conspiracy of love. You know, that it, it, when we can work with people when they're suffering, there's an opportunity for real transformation because, you know, change is hard. But if you're in enough pain, then suddenly the idea of change becomes more interesting. Kind of like when I was about to kill myself, I was open to making changes that if I'd listened to the Swami, you know, a year before, I would say, what, what the hell is that weird stuff, you know? Uh, so I tried it. And then when you try it, because these biological mechanisms are so dynamic, you really feel the benefits really quickly. And when you go get off them, you feel you don't feel as good. Like, oh, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good. Let me do more of this and less of that. And it comes from your own experience. Then the suffering can be a, a, a catalyst for true transformation, which again, can give that meaning as well. Um, you know, uh, because change is hard. But if you're in enough pain, the idea of change becomes more interesting. And that's part of why we do the research to say, look, if you're willing to make these changes, there's a good chance that you can get these benefits as well. And so for me, the, the suffering becomes a doorway for true transformation. And I can't tell you how many patients have said things to me over the years. Like, I remember the first time someone said to me, you know, Dean, having a heart attack was the best thing that ever happened to me. And the first time I heard that, I thought, like, what are you, nuts? <laughs> and they say, no, that's what it took to get my attention to begin making these changes that have transformed my life to such a degree. I'm, I'm, my relationships are getting better with my family and my my spouse and my kids, you know, I'm rediscovering inner sources of peace and joy and well-being. I'm able to um, do things that I wasn't able to do before. My diseases are getting better, et cetera. And had I not, you know, had that experiences, I never would have gotten interested in doing that. And so it allows us to reframe sometimes the most horrible times of our life, like in my case, when I was so depressed, as a doorway for transformation that enabled me to, to get to where I am today. And so for me, it's a sacred opportunity as a, as a physician to be able to work with people when they're suffering, uh, when there's that window of opportunity to help them see that as a doorway uh, for really transforming their lives in ways that go beyond just, you know, physically unclogging their arteries or whatever it is that we're measuring. Mm. That is absolutely beautiful, Dean. And, and 
as you're talking, you know, I'm thinking just not only do all these things you're talking about in lifestyle changes work, but, you know, it's such a different thing for the individual when an action they take is improving them. It's so much more empowering than, you know, taking a drug or doing a procedure and kind of reinforcing somebody that's already down, that's already sick, that's maybe already depressed or whatever they're going through. And just something like that just reinforces the belief that they're broken and they're not enough and they don't have the power to overcome these things versus which you teach, which is these, these actions where, where they are taking back control and, and it's empowering the individual. And I just love your approach. It's, it's incredible. Well, thank you. You're right. You know, when we, I mean, first of all, drugs and surgery can be life-saving when used appropriately. We've all benefited from that. But they're generally the beginning, not the end. You know, like when someone's, um, uh, I remember I was in a race called the Beta Breakers Race. It's in San Francisco tradition. You've got the serious runners, and then you've got people like me who just liked it out for fun, and then you've got people who, you know, race you know, naked or in drag or whatever. You know, it's an <laughs> eight-and-a-half-mile race. And I remember around mile five, I was getting a little tired and looking for an excuse to slow down. And there was a guy lying, lying face down on the pavement. I thought, well, that's a good excuse. So I went over. He had no pulse, started, started doing CPR. Another uh, guy who was actually a friend of mine is a professor. We both did CPR. Someone brought a defibrillator. We got his heart started. And um, he ended up having bypass surgery um, by a, he was an English teacher from Seattle, Washington. And the surgeon ended up being one of his former pupils, just one of those weird synchronous, synchronicity things. But, you know, when I saw him, I didn't feed him broccoli and teach him to meditate. You know, we brought him, started his heart up and he ended up having surgery. He needed it. So mm-hmm. drugs and surgery can be life-saving. But then at that point, it was like, okay, how did you get in this situation? And what can you do to get out of it? when people get put on these drugs to lower their cholesterol and blood pressure and, and blood sugar and so on, and told they have to take them for the rest of their lives. Well, we're finding again, under their doctor supervision that many people can reduce or in some cases get off these drugs altogether, which is incredibly empowering as opposed to being reminded several times a day that they're dependent on something. It's very empowering to feel like, Oh, I'm getting better. I don't need these things. Or they're able, we did a study uh, with Harvard and uh, eight other sites for academic centers for community hospitals. And we found that uh, 77% of people who were told they needed a stent or a bypass were able to choose our lifestyle program as a direct alternative. Uh, they did just as well. Uh, Mutual of Omaha saved almost $30,000 per patient in the first year. Um, so, you know, however you look at it, whether it's from the lens of saving money or reducing the need for medication or surgery or transforming your lives, you know, it all really comes back to the same thing, which is these simple lifestyle changes that we write about in our new book and undo it can really help people uh, use the experience of suffering to transform and undo and often reverse the progression of the most common uh, chronic diseases. And of course, if you can reverse something, then you can help prevent it as well. Amazing. Well, Dean, I know we're coming up on an hour here and um, that was absolutely incredible. I know, I know people will take so much from this. And again, I just want to thank you. I'll certainly leave links to the book and, and all you do um, in the notes for this show. And um, thank you, Dean. You, you truly are, and again, from the Macaulay's here in Boston, thank you. And you are, you are truly impacting uh, more lives than you probably know. So I am rooting for you. Keep going. And um, it, it's a beautiful thing. And I, and I really appreciate your time and, and all you shared. Well, I'm grateful to you and thank you for your kind words and please give a hug to your mom, Eileen. Uh, it's, um, it's been a long time and I still remember her well. Amazing. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. All the best. All righty.